we were preparing for this night and uh, I was feeling like, and Ali and I were discussing this, that although we do a lot of work about sleep and we've all chatted about sleep a lot, that we really wanted someone who has spent a lot of time learning about sleep, especially with children and um, thinking about it. And, you know, an expert in sleep would do us all well. Um, as Chris, as you know, with Christy and I, we uh, preach good sleep habits, but when we raised our, our youngest children, we had terrible, we were terrible sleep parents. So um, we always say, do what we say, not what we do, but it's nice to have someone who can guide us a little bit more on sleep. So Rebecca is here. Um, Rebecca is from, um, I just have forgotten the name of your sleep. Rebecca, what's your sleep consulting? I, I just go under my name, Rebecca Mendoza. So Rebecca Mendoza is from Rebecca Mendoza Sleep Consulting. Um, she is a sleep consultant who helps all people sleep well. Um, she is going to give us a little presentation about um, sleep, and then she's going to be open to any and all questions. Um, so we will, you know, you will have time to kind of share your challenges, and she will give excellent advice. If there's anything that isn't answered today. You can feel free to email us and we will we will um, ask Rebecca again on, on your behalf if we can't solve that problem and um, and it will be recorded so that you can come back and look at it when you're feeling, you know, five in the morning when you haven't slept in a few hours, you can you can watch and remember. Um, and so I'm going to send it over to Rebecca and let her take it away for the evening. And thank you for being here with us. We're so excited. Well, thanks, Kate, and I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'll start out just by saying that I tend to get kind of nervous in presentations, and I, I'll warm up, but I might be a little bit shaky at the beginning. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides, and I'm sorry to say that I didn't quite figure out how to share the slides properly like I have last time, things have changed on the Google Slides and I don't have the same option I used to. So now you have to look at my bookmarks and I'm sorry that that's how it is, um, but it's the best I could do for today. Um, you'll be able to see the slides. How does that look? Looks good. Okay, thanks. So yes, um, I'm just gonna move the images over. Hmm. Sorry, guys. Start again. Um. Oh, something changed. <laughs> <laughs> you magically did it. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I, I trained at the Family Sleep Institute and I have uh, been, you know, very preoccupied with sleep since my children were really young. My first um, was, you know, a victim of all of the moves that I did uh, to, you know, the, the things I swore I wouldn't do um, with sleep. I, I did all those things and then I was really suffering and um, I did sleep training with, with him at about five months. And once I got the sleep, I, um, I was pretty obsessed with keeping, keeping that going. And I, um, I still protect it pretty closely. And now my kids are 14 and 11. Um, I'm a dancer. I danced most of my life and I transitioned into sleep consulting a couple of years ago. And, and so I, I do coach parents uh, with their children's sleep um, from newborn to, you know, around, usually I don't see families with kids older than around age 10, um, but this age group is a special age group. So I'm going to stick to mainly 18 to 18 months to three years, and um, we can get more specific that way. Um, so when we're talking about sleep for any age group, we want to start with the building blocks, which is healthy sleep hygiene. Um, when it comes to environment, we know that we sleep better in the dark. Also, our, our brains will make melatonin, the sleep hormone, when it's dark. Um, we want to have a calm environment in the room. We want to you know, either have quiet or a really great noise machine, which I love. Um, and... Uh, we want it to be cool uh, in the air. 
And um, uh, these are you know, some of the basic things that most people know. Uh, so in terms of preparation, um, that I say preparation and what I mean is bedtime routine. So a lot of people know this already. Sometimes as our kids get a bit older, we, we drop some of those pieces um, or when we're rushing, we cut through some of that and move a little bit quickly. We want to make sure to protect that time. Um, a consistent uh, bedtime routine is really important to cue the body that it's time for sleep. And it's also really great to set the stage for you know, calming the body, relaxing the mind before sleep. So it's it's important to keep that bedtime routine. It can be, you know, for this age group, we're talking about something like a half an hour, right? But making sure that it's consistent and, and calming. Quantity of sleep is important. Um, there is a range for each age. And so uh, what I like to say to parents is that we want to make sure that you're watching your children to see how they're doing because some kids are on the lower end of sleep needs and some are on the higher end and a lot are right in the middle. Um, but in order to know whether your child is getting enough sleep, you, you kind of have to see how they're doing. How do they seem when they wake up? How are they um, around supper time? Um, so that's an important point. And I'm, I have a little chart that I'm going to show you for the range of, of you know, total sleep hours. Schedule matters. Um, you know, it does matter that we sleep at night and it matters when we go to bed early. Um, we actually get more deep sleep when we go to bed early. Our bodies are programmed to have longer periods of deep sleep before around 11 p.m. So when we when we miss that time, we actually do miss some of the deep sleep. Um, obviously our children are going to bed before that time, but it's just good to keep in mind for everybody, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, making sure that there are the right amount of wake, uh, wake times between waking in the morning and nap and, and then bedtime. Um, skills, so I'm talking about self-soothing skills. It does, really uh, make a huge difference in terms of being able to um, sleep all the way through the night when your children can soothe themselves to sleep. And I'll say a lot more about that soon. Consolidation is having all the sleep happen together at night rather than being awake for periods of time in the night. So I'm just gonna chat very briefly about light in the brain because we, we've all been hearing a lot about this, but what's true is that the blue light exposure from screens any kind of screen, whether it be TV screens, uh, phones, iPads, but also um, really bright bathroom lights like mine. <laughs> I have these lights that I swear you could do surgery in. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm aware of that. I, now I've put a little lamp in there so that it's not so, so bright. But for some people who are really sensitive to the light, it matters, right? So you should be dimming your lights after supper and making sure that your kids aren't seeing any screens. Some kids really need to see no screens two hours before bedtime. Um, there, there are these cells in the eyes that are different from the rods and the cones. They are this um, really fun word here, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So it's a really great name. And they are the ones that take the light in and tell the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, to stop producing melatonin. So when that happens, our brain actually goes into daytime mode. So our brains are always either producing sleep or producing wakefulness. So when that, when you know we see this blue light, our brains go into daytime mode, and that's why it can be more difficult to fall asleep. And it's. Uh, really matters. Okay, so here are the recommended hours of sleep by age. So this is just a, a chart that I use as a guideline. Um, I've got a couple um, from 12 to 23 months and from two to three years, that, that's the range we're dealing with here. You can see that it's still a pretty big range. That's why it's not always useful just to go by these charts. I tend to find that with my clients, most people are, um, you know, like if you're going at the lower end, the 12 to 23 months, the 12 month old is more likely to need the 14, but about 14 hours, right? And um, so the older ones tend to need a little bit less. Uh, 
it's not unusual for a three-year-old to only need about 12 hours, but a lot will need more like 13 hours of sleep. So you kind of have to just check on how your kid is doing. Um, uh, yeah, you can ask me more questions about that. I wanted to just talk about some signs that your child could be overtired in case you're not sure, right? Um, the first one tends to be more about younger children um, because this kind of association with feeding to sleep tends to, you know, wean off a little bit as they get older. Um, but for those babies who are breastfeeding um, or bottle feeding, um, it, it can be that they are looking for more of that when they're sleepy to help to kind of comfort them into dreamland. Um, waking up crying or waking up grouchy. So some kids will just kind of wake up grouchy as their, that's their mode and they just need a little bit of time to come to the day, that's fine. But um, it might be something to consider. Uh, waking up, waking throughout the night. So when your child is overtired, it does, uh, it makes it more difficult for the body to cycle through the stages of sleep and, and you stay in a, a lighter sleep. So then sleep is restless, kids are more likely to wake up and that's, that can cause trouble. Um, general fussy mood, that's obvious, mood swings and tantrums. So it's just something to mention because a lot of people think at this age group, um, it's normal to have children who are you know, having mood swings or tantrums. And I don't think I would just say that that's generally true. I think that I would rather uh, ask myself what's happening here because um, it, it very often could be that your child is tired. Right, it's tough to get through a day when when you're tired, so they don't have a lot of resources or tools to you know, suppress that that feeling. So um, something to consider. Lots of crying when going to sleep. Yeah, um, that relates to um, hyper energy near bedtime, which is coming up in a second. I'm going to get to that. Waking too early in the morning can be a sign that your child is overtired. Again, it's that kind of disruption of sleep cycles. Um, difficulty with attention or memory, we do start to see that, you know, you'll see when your child is tired, that this kind of like focus wanes a little bit in their eyes. Um, and then with older children, you start to see problems with memory. So I'm going to get to this um, crying when going to sleep and hyper energy in your bedtime, because um, when we miss a sleep window, the brain will release cortisol to help us get through the time that we're tired and, and sleepy and supposed to be sleeping. So the cortisol gives us energy to, to kind of ride that time when we should be sleeping. And what happens to children when that cortisol is released is they seem quite hyper. So if you're seeing that your child ends up with this kind of like high energy, a little bit higher than you would expect after supper, it's possible that they're kind of running on fumes and hitting that second wind. It's what we call hitting the second wind. It's like, if you had gotten them to bed a little earlier, they might've been fine. But once they miss that point, um, things start to go a little awry. So some of you might be familiar with that mode. Waking is normal. So um, between our sleep cycles, it's normal to have these micro wakings for all of us, right? So we have four sleep stages. There's three non-REM stages, like light sleep, kind of medium depth, and then deep sleep, and then we have REM sleep. And after each cycle of that, um, we tend to have little micro wakings. Our, ch our children's cycles are shorter than ours. Adults' cycles are around 90 minutes. They do vary, but and they vary as the night goes on. Um, but when we have these little micro wakings, these are times that a lot of us don't even notice are happening. We roll over in the night, we, you know, we adjust our positions or our blankets and things like that. Um, but for children who don't have a lot of self-soothing skills, when they have this micro waking, they don't, they can't just easily roll over and get themselves back to sleep. If they don't have the skills, they will often wake up into a, a much more um, wakeful state and start to request help, right? So um, 
that's where we're talking about sleep associations, the help that they're looking for. Um, sometimes if your child is requesting a lot of help to get to sleep in the first place, like you're lying down beside them, or you have to hold their hand or rub their back, you need to rock them, you need to sing to them, you need to be there in some way. Um, those are sleep associations, which um, make sense. And um, sometimes they, they hang on to those because they give them a lot of comfort, right? Um, you know, I have sleep associations too. I like to lie down in a bed. I like to have a pillow. I like to have my very specific cervical pillow. I like to have a pillow for my knees. I like to need to have my mouth guard in. It's a whole thing. Uh, and I can sleep without the, those things, but I wouldn't like to. Um, but at least nobody has to do any of those things for me. And uh, eventually it's nice if children have the skills to, you know, soothe themselves to sleep. And, you, you know, if those, those sleep associations are really strong by this age, um, you know, you might be in a position where you're looking to wean off of those. Okay. So when are they a problem? Uh, when children can't um, connect those sleep cycles, right? That's a problem um, because it's really important to have a consolidated night of sleep, right? It's best for everyone. Um, and then sometimes the actions are really burdensome for parents, right? For in terms of their emotional health, um, you know, how much time are you spending helping your kid get to sleep um, and helping them get back to sleep? Um, how stressful is it? Uh, in, my, in my experience, it's extremely stressful um, and um, it, it's burdensome. So sometimes it's physically burdensome. Um, oh, there's someone's mic on. <laughs> I can continue. Um, yeah, sometimes they're physically burdensome, thanks, um, because you're carrying your child. I remember um, that, you know, that moment because I used to hold my my youngest one and kind of bounce him a little bit and sing him a song. And I loved doing it. But I remember thinking he's getting so big. Um, this has to happen a different way now. So, yeah, that's when those are a problem. OK. These are some things to talk about in terms of things we often see. Okay, so we usually see a one nap schedule um, by 18 months. And most kids are still napping at three years. Uh, some drop the nap earlier. Um, separation anxiety. Yeah, um, a lot of my clients talk about that, that their kid is just glued to them. They do not, they, they're not allowed to leave their sight, right? Uh, sleep apnea. We at, at around this age, we do start to see some signs of sleep apnea. Um, if your child is breathing with their mouth open when they sleep, um, and or if they're snoring when they're sleeping, you might want to ask your doctor for an ENT appointment to check the tonsils and adenoids in case there's an obstructive um, sleep apnea going on. That you know that will do some that will cause waking in the night. It's micro wakings and a lot of people with sleep apnea who have uh, strong self-soothing skills will not notice that they are waking from the sleep apnea. But if your child has sleep apnea and they don't have great, uh, very consistent sleep, uh, <laughs> self-soothing skills, um, they might be you know, waking a little more often than, than normal because of the sleep apnea. So it's just something to check out. Um, bedtime resistance, yes. Pushing boundaries, oh yeah. Moving out of the crib, exactly. So around this age, a lot of kids are um, are not no longer in a crib, so they've got a lot of freedom in their room. Potty training readiness, which can definitely affect sleep, and um, it's something that I think very often should take precedence in terms of like having to make choices around what do we do here. Um, we want to honor their experience with their body so that they're starting to really understand um, their, their experiences. Um, so that can disrupt some sleep. And I think you just need to be patient with that, but I have some ideas around it to help. Um, so what we wanna do is focus on the sleep environment. Yes, especially if the child is out of a crib and they have freedom in the room, we wanna make sure that the room is really safe. I'm not a sleep expert, so I'm not gonna advise you on that, but there are really great resources um, to make sure that you know, your, your child cannot be climbing on things or pulling down dressers and things like that. Um, 
Uh, I also really like the idea of using gates at the door or um, keeping the door closed in a way that your child can't really access. And that is not in any way a punishment, but just a way to keep your child safe and to remind their body that it's sleep time. I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. Bedtime routine, yes, I talked about that already. Um, in terms of a firm and fair approach, um, that's related to the next line, setting consistent boundaries. So we want to make sure that, you know, parents are in charge of what's healthy here. Um, ch children are not really at this age in a position to make some of the healthy choices for themselves. Um, so we're gonna set consistent boundaries and then we're going to take a firm and fair approach to maintaining those boundaries so that they have a sense of security around them. Um, you know, if, if there's a, you know, if you guys have decided in the bedtime routine that there's going to be three books before bed, and then your child pushes and pushes and pushes for a fourth book and you budge on it, even though it, you know, you might look at your clock and say, there's time, I think we'll do another book. It just leaves your child with this feeling of, oh, I, I guess that boundary wasn't secure. I wonder what else is insecure, do you know? Um, and it gives them a sense of insecurity. So I really believe that, you know, as much as possible, we just need to hold those boundaries um, so that they know, you know, it's their job to push and it's your job to hold it firm. They're, they're looking to find out where, how far can I go and what are the boundaries here? Offering opportunities um, for them to make some decisions. I, I really believe in this too. Um, so some things like what are the books? What are those three books? That can be their decision. Um, what are the pajamas I'm wearing tonight? Um, maybe what's the song we're gonna play in the morning? What's the kind of kitchen dance party song going to be? So I love to give them all kinds of um, age appropriate decision-making opportunities. Teaching some independence. So that was one of the things I was um, thinking about in terms of potty training readiness. Um, it, you know, asking to use the toilet is often a bedtime stalling technique. It works really, really well when you're in this kind of potty training phase. Um, ready to use the toilet. Um, I think I need to pee again. Maybe I need to poop. That can go on for a long time. <laughs> and it can really, it's a really effective bedtime stalling technique. So um, I love it when parents have a, a little potty that can go in the bedroom and then you teach your child how to use it. Um, and then they have the option of using it and that power struggle goes away completely. Uh, the other thing is just, you know, do they know how to fix their blankets by themselves? Things like that so that they're not depending on you and you don't feel like they are incapable, but some of these things are obviously appropriate. And as Montessori kids, they know how to do so many things. Um, so family sleep meetings are really, really great. Um, 18 months is maybe a little young. Oh, how did that happen? Oh, it, <laughs> it shifted on its own. I don't know how to move it. Um, Okay, I'll just go on from there. I know what it is. Um, but in the family meeting, you can um, explain all the things they're doing really well and talk about whether there are some new strategies and you know, talk together about it. And you can make posters like this bedtime routine poster, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, so that um, you, know, you get your kids on board and it's something that you can continue to talk about, keep it really, really short, right? And, um, and and they can have some really good ideas too. I really like that. So with the bedtime routine poster, um, this can be either made like little cards, one at a time, like a little book almost, or you can have a poster maybe in the bathroom, something like that. So um, you guys are gonna get, I think, a link to this. You can just print it out yourself. Um, but I really think it's, fun when you can take pictures of your own child doing the things that they do in their bedtime routine and make a poster of them because don't they love to look at pictures of themselves? Um, and also your bedtime routine might look completely different from this. Um, but this is just an example of something you could do. And I love to ask the children, you know, what's next? 
put them in charge of this. They can check the chart and they can go ahead and tell you what's next. And they might take some pride in knowing that. Oh my goodness, now I can't move the video. I mean, the presentation. Okay, um, sleep rules, sorry guys. All right, so they're old enough for sleep rules. And this is something that you can practice. So um, practice and preparation is really uh, necessary if you're going to implement any new strategies, okay? So um, you just need to communicate these things with them. What are your expectations? These are the kinds of things you can talk about during a family sleep meeting. And then practice it with them, do role play at home. You go lie down in their bed and ask them, you know, what's next, right? I lie down, I stay in bed, I stay quiet, I breathe slowly, I close my eyes, I go to sleep, I wait until it's time to get up. And when I see, um, I drew this little clock, um, it's representing an okay to wake clock or a toddler clock. I love those because it just helps your children know without you having to tell them. It's not your job anymore to say it's not morning yet. The clock will tell them. And then it's totally out of your hands. It's not your fault. Um, so I really love that tool. And I love the sleep rules tool. And that one can go right in their bedroom. And um, yeah, like I said, practice it, role play, um, have their toys do it. All of that stuff is really good. Oh, that's funny. I thought I erased that one. I didn't think I'd have time for adult sleep. I just had a little slide about adult sleep because... Um, Talk about it. It's important. Okay. <laughs> you got time. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, we suffer from uh, poor sleep hygiene too. And um, your re regular schedules um, is, it can be, you know, some people can't help that because of their work situation and what are you gonna do? But when you can, um, keep a regular schedule, going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time, set your alarm. No bedtime routine. Yeah, a lot of us just jump into bed and think that sleep is gonna come, but we need to wind ourselves down too. We need our own bedtime routine. Um, and actually, you know, our brains can be cued by the, the kind of consistent bedtime routine. Um, insufficient exercise, um, that's, that's real. You need to get exercise, try to get it early in the day. It will help us sleep. Sleep onset insomnia is really, um, it's very, very common. It's usually more common in young adults, but, um, and then sleep maintenance insomnia is more common as we get older. Um, those, you know, those things uh, can be difficult to treat, but starting with just regular good old sleep hygiene is um, a good way to go. But uh, anxiety and depression uh, will really feed into insomnia. So, and it's like a vicious cycle. So you have to, you know, you have to take care of those things. You have to seek out help. Um, and some people don't even notice that they have depression or anxiety, but they notice that their sleep is, is suffering. So, you know, it's just something to consider. Uh, screens too late, definitely. Uh, sleep apnea is another, it's another time in our adulthood. And um, some people don't realize it, right? And it, it's very, very common and it affects our health um, negatively, like mostly heart stuff. Um, but it's, it's really quite serious and it's highly treatable. So we wanna focus on limiting caffeine and alcohol. When we drink alcohol in the evening, um, it, can, it can affect sleep because it gets um, metabolized later and it gets metabolized you know, when we're asleep and then it activates the body. So a lot of people who have trouble staying asleep um, might wanna look at whether they're drinking alcohol too late in the evening, um, creating a regular schedule, prioritizing mental health, rigorous exercise, seeing bright morning light, that can help to reset our circadian clock if you're having trouble falling asleep and consistency, of course. Rebecca, do you mind speaking also to the, like the, the martyr syndrome we suffer from as parents and like giving, giving our sleep up for our children's sleep or our trying to get our children to sleep? Yeah, it's, um, it's so common for us to just say, this is, this is where I am. I'm stuck doing this. And, uh, you know, I think that we need to set an example for our children by prioritizing sleep. You know, we have to prioritize sleep for the entire family. And so, um, you know, it's some people who study sleep will say that sleep is more important than nutrition. Um, and, and so, and, and exercise and things like that. It is, 
it's so key. And we're, we're only, you know, in the past several years, just starting to understand how important it is. And so we have to start with ourselves. Even during the family sleep meeting, you can talk about what are some things that, that I, as a parent, can do to, for, to help my own sleep. I think it's really effective to say, I've been going to bed a little bit late, or, you know, I, I notice I do that on the weekends, and then I sleep in, and then I feel kind of out of sorts. Um, yeah, we need to prioritize our own sleep. And if that means you need to, um, you know, look at your own child's sleep and see if there are strategies that can help them sleep through the night so that you can then get a good night's sleep, I would start there. It's so, so important. Thanks. Yeah. So um, that's the end of the slides. And I know I rushed through things really quickly because I thought that people were going to have probably specific questions um, about a lot of the things that I touched on. Great. Thank you. Shall we take a moment to breathe and come up with some of some of these questions that have come up during our during our conversations already uh, in past therapies that we've talked about sleep. So bring them to Rebecca and um, she will she will help us out. So when you have a question, feel free to unmute and just introduce yourself and and away you go, your children. Who's brave? Julia. Yeah, go. <laughs> Um, so we have a uh, almost two year old who is really an awesome sleeper at night. He always really has been. Naps have always been our big thing that he fights. And like I would say, honestly, from the time he was a baby until still, um, he either like is scream crying before he goes down for a nap or is scream crying after he wakes up. And it's like something I've tried to Google countless number of times. Like, why is my two-year-old waking up screaming after an hour long nap? Like, is that just like, that's just him. And it's something that we're just going to have to deal with until he's done napping or. <laughs> yeah, it, it depends. Like, um, so one thing I'll say about scream crying is that a lot of kids, um, you know, way, way earlier than that, like, you know, five month old, they can, they can learn that there's a sound that will make their parents come running. They practice those and they said, what about this? What about, oh, and especially during sleep training, you'll, I'll have a lot of clients say, um, oh, the, they're making a brand new sound and it's like extreme screaming. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to ignore that because, you know, if it's something new, of course you have to make sure that they're okay. But sometimes they are just trying it out because they're saying they're seeing that your response is different. Oh, they don't run in anymore to feed me when I wake up. What if I scream? So I'll just say, you know, very briefly that sometimes they adopt um, an extreme sound because they know it's going to get uh, attention. Yeah. But um, just in general, in terms of crying to sleep and crying when they wake up, it can often be that they're overtired. But at this age, it's also true that they have, um, it's pretty common for kids to have a fear of missing out. Um, at this age, they're not too interested in, in sleeping in the day. They know you guys aren't sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, there are different strategies to deal with that. Also, sometimes there needs to be a bit of a schedule shift, um, making sure that they are, you know, not sleeping too much at night and, and still building sleep pressure for the nap. Um, but uh, I just want to say. We're also like, we did do like sleep training when he was about six months old. So like we're, and we're not really not ones to like run in when he like peeps. Yeah. Usually but like there's, there's, bit. yeah, there's some days where I'm like, you just need like alone time in your room. If you're not going to nap, that's fine. But then he will cry for like an hour. <laughs> so he, he'll cry for an hour instead of sleeping yes. or he'll yeah. cry instead of sleep. Yeah. Okay. On or off, or he'll, he'll like he'll do a 20 minute nap, nap and then cry for an hour. Cry for five more minutes, nap, cry for, yeah. He'll, he'll kind of sometimes on and off, but we, like, like I said, we're, we let him cry for a bit. We're like, you're in your room, you're resting, you're safe. Like, yeah, I yeah. Know that cry. I know what you're doing. So you're okay. good. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So it's possible he's just needing a little less sleep, but it is really a, it's so much harder for kids to sleep in the daytime. So, um, you know, making sure that the room is really, really dark so that it feels like nighttime sleep so that they're not distracted by things in their room. Um, 
making sure that there's like maybe a mini bedtime routine for nap too. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the activities that happened before? Is he, is he getting lots of outdoor time, lots of, um, you know, fresh air activity to t- tire him out? Um, and yes, yeah, some kids will just cry on their way to sleep as a kind of release. Um, but most kids don't keep uh, crying when they wake up unless they're still tired. Um, so it's pretty common to be still, to, to kind of wake up crying when they're still tired. Um, so it's tough. It's tough at this age to continue with the nap. You're doing the right thing by allowing there to just be quiet time. You, you can't force them to sleep. So you have to just be giving him the opportunity, making sure the environment is right for sleep and that he's really nice and tired out and ready for it. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. Good job. All right. Who else has a question? I know there are a lot, so be brave. Unmute. Um, hi, guys. I, <laughs> I have so many like problems. I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I was like, if no one has a question, we'll turn it over to Adita. She'll take us home <laughs> for the next hour. <laughs> I don't want to hog this whole session, but basically, in a nutshell, I'm Adita, by the way, and my kid is almost two and a half and she basically never sleeps ever she's up every sleep cycle all night long you have to rock her all night long to put her to sleep she cries all night long but she's full of energy all day she's happy when she wakes up she I don't know she does sleep with her mouth open and she does snore sometimes so I do have an ENG referral Okay. We actually have an actual sleep study coming up in Toronto where they hook her up to whatever. Uh, yeah, good. Oh, so I've done sleep training three times with her. I started when she was nine months, then uh-huh. 18 months, then 24 months. She was colic for like the first eight months. So she cried 24 seven. She sure. also had like um, acid reflux bad. So anyways, there was always a, I always blame something on the sleep. Yeah. Even an excuse sort of thing. Yeah, um, I obviously have developed really bad sleep habits with her. We co-sleep with her and it's mainly my mom because I have to somehow function as a human. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I yeah. don't know. I mean, so when you did the sleep training, mm-hmm. was there ever a time where things were going well? Yeah. So when she was nine months, it went well for two months where she slept all night, most of the uh-huh. night. And then she started teething and then... so. You know, so, some, so she started to have difficulty with teething and therefore, because she was in pain, you started to offer a little more help. Yes, exactly. She got used to it. They get used to it like that. Yeah. I mess it up the whole time, like every time. So, well, my mom, mostly. I'm yeah. going to blame my mom. Sure. Let's blame her. <laughs> so that's the thing. I mean, it's, it's really tough and it, and it can happen to the best of us. You know, you put all that work in for the sleep training and you never want to you never want to let it go. Um, but when they're sick or when they're in pain, you have to offer a little more support. You have to do it. There's no way around it. But when you know that they're okay, you need to get back to that consistent plan. And so as they get older, it can get a little bit tougher, right? Because they start telling you, (laughs) they can tell you what they want. They know how to push your buttons. They know you inside out. And so You know, you and your mom need to make a plan. You guys need to say this enough is enough because you're not doing her any favors. She's up all night. You guys are up all night and it's everyone's going to be unhealthy, right? So you guys need to decide how it's going to be, right? And provide the opportunity for her. It's going to be tough. She's not going to be happy. So this is one of the things that can be really, really tough for parents because these little kids have big, big feelings. And I know that um, I never wanted my kids to experience some of those big feelings. I kind of wanted to do anything I could to prevent it um, because I was afraid of it. I didn't know. I, I found it really stressful. And when I look back, I realize what I did right to avoid it. Um, so I just think that when, you know, you just have to actually prepare yourself for that. And even for her, right. You need to say, 
we're going to be trying new things, right? We're going to have a family sleep meeting. We're going to be trying these new things because we know we all need to sleep. I just spoke with a family um, sleep expert and she told me to do these things and we're going to do them because we need to do them for our health. And it's my responsibility to keep you safe and healthy, right? And so there are some changes that we're going to need to make. And you're not going to like all of them, but I think you're going to be really proud at some of the progress that you may that you make during this process. And I'm, you know, I'm going to help you through it, right? And so when you make these changes, um, you need to stick to your guns. You need to say, this is how we're going to make this work for our family. And you need to be firm and fair about it. But also, if something happens that is, you know, difficult, it's okay to say that was a really tough night, right? And I'm sorry, it was a tough night and we're gonna try again tomorrow, no problem, right? We're just gonna try again tomorrow. And for even for you, right? Because we all mess up a little bit when we're trying to do these things. It's difficult, it's emotional, right? So give yourself a little break, write yourself some mant mantras to help you get through it. Ask your mom to be you know, a partner in this. She needs to get on, on board too. Now, do you suggest like you sort of just shut the door and sayonara? So, there are all kinds of methods for sleep training. That one is called cry it out. And not a lot of people choose it because um, they prefer to be more involved. Um, there are other kinds of methods like the chair method where you start in the room on a chair near the bed and you sit there until they fall asleep. And if they wake up in the night, you go back to the chair and you sit there until they fall asleep. And you stay in one position for three nights and all naps. And then after three nights, you move the chair a little bit further away and then until you get out of the door. Okay, so this is it's extremely um, tiring. <laughs> it's, it allows parents to be there in the room. I would never choose it for myself. You have to be awake. You can't be sitting there on your phone. Um, and you have to be present but without doing the things that they want you to do. So in some ways it can be more frustrating for kids because you're, you're sitting there looking at them, but you're not doing all the things they want you to do. But for some kids, it, it offers so much reassurance that you're there that it can work really well. It's almost like a pre-training method where you're, you know, you're really there, you're present in the room and you're moving yourself out very, very gradually. But from the, the chair method, what we do is then move to a checks method, checking on them. And that can be a method that you start with instead. It's what most of my clients will choose um, because it offers reassurance that you're still there, but, um, but you get in and out really quickly, right? So if you're closing the door, that's great. If you're wanting to do the checks, you can keep the door just a little bit open. And like there's a method called the sleep wave method from a book called The Happy Sleeper. I love the book. I love the method. Um, there's also the Ferber method, which is um, graduated extinction. So the intervals between the checks are getting wider and wider, starting with, you know, something like three to three or five minutes. And then the next time you check it's seven minutes, the next time you check it's nine minutes, you just kind of stay there for the first night. Then you start at the, that last place, the second night. So you gradually build the space in between giving your child opportunity to learn the self-soothing skills. The sleep wave method is a method where you return at a regular interval, every five minutes you return and you just say a quick little, great job, I love you, I'll be back in five minutes, you're gone. You shouldn't be there longer than seven seconds. You're not gonna go in there and hug them and fix their blanket or anything like that. Um, so I really like those methods, cried out method, um, where you close the door and good luck. It can be really, really good for some parents who A, are too exhausted to do anything else, B, know their child so well that they know that for some kids, even the checks is too much stimulation. It offers too many opportunities for a lot of negotiation. And if you know yourself well enough to know that I know I'm going to be caught up in some kind of negotiation about, can I have another sip of water or can, oh, but remember when you, I wanted a little cuddle time or whatever. And that just reminds me of another um, little strategy where if you have a child who wants a lot more cuddle time and you're starting to feel insecure, like, oh, they needed more of me and I should have cuddled them to sleep and stuff like that you need to schedule that into your day, right? There's going to be morning cuddle time. There's going to be after school cuddle time and you need to call it whatever you want to call it. You need to name it. You need to refer to it. And when your child is asking for that kind of comfort at night, you can say, I cannot wait for our morning cuddle time. It's going to come at 6 45 and I'm really looking forward to it. 
right? So that they know that they have you and that you dedicate time for that. And actually this time is for sleep. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, I didn't get all the way into how the methods work, um, but you know, you can get that information online pretty easily. Maybe Rebecca, you can like give us a list of all the methods too, is like, and how do you, how does one choose one of those methods? Like, do you? Yeah, it, you know, that's usually um, what I do in a consultation, which is just chatting to parents about what are your comfort levels around how much involvement you want. So um, you'll hear of methods that are called gentle methods. And I don't tend to use that term because um, what someone might find gentle, like the chair method, for example, people call it gentle because they're there with their child um, and they think it's easier on kids to do that. Um, it's actually just more gradual. It takes that, that process takes longer. So I call it gradual versus gen, instead of calling it gentle. Um, it actually can be more difficult for some kids to do a method like that. Like I said, they can be more frustrated that you're sitting there looking at them and not doing the thing that you want, that they want you to do. Um, and so sometimes the less gradual methods um, can be a kindness to a child who just needs the opportunity to see very clearly what it is that's expected of them and they, they learn it more quickly. So I'm in favor of anything that a parent feels comfortable with because when you feel like you, you really understand the method and you feel good about it, you're liable to be more consistent because the consistency is what is key. So that's what I talk about in the consultation, you know, and not, not always, you know, like if you've got two parents, they don't always agree with each other. Um, so that's another discussion. And, um, and then sometimes parents make a decision and they feel really good about a method and they start it and night one or night two, they realize this is not working for my kid. This is not the right method for them. Or, you know, some, I just worked with a client who was using the chair method and they noticed that at nap time, their kid could see them pretty clearly sitting there in the chair and it mattered. And he was just like looking at them and frustrated. It wasn't working, right? So some Sometimes you adapt a method. So you do, you know, the chair method at night and, and they did checks in the day and then they took away the checks completely, you know, so you, sometimes you just have to start it and see, it's almost always better to go from more involvement to less involvement rather than working the other way around. Just another question. Um, and thank you so much for this presentation. I just, I want more. <laughs> it's, it's, it was really great. And the pictures were beautiful. Um, so in, in those, those circumstances you're talking about where let's say parents have a hard time being as strict as each other. So for instance, with our uh, youngest daughter, um, she, yeah, it was a difficult pregnancy. Like we didn't know if we'd lose her, all this really awful stuff. And then recently she, she ended up with a really serious accident. And, and then it's like all of this like stuff where we're just like, we're glad you're here. And then it's like, she's crying. And my mom heart is like, I can't, yeah, I can't just, you know, everything from, you know, when she got back from the hospital, them telling us like, you know, kind of go easy on her but then trying to weigh that out that was September now it's you know February so so then my husband who's in one of these squares um he's he's much more like Clara you need to cry for this amount of time and I'm downstairs like counting the minutes being like I think we need to like step in now you know so it's, I mean, it's well and good to say this, but I feel like sometimes, sometimes it's, yeah, he can be a lot more like we're working through this type yeah. attitude. And I literally, I'm like, okay, I'm going to be crying in a minute. So yeah. yeah. How do you deal with that? Thank you for sharing that. Um, oh, I really feel for you because you know, that, that is such a big issue because even, even parents who haven't actually experienced that kind of trauma um, will have these experiences with each other in terms of a real difference around how they're seeing the, the situation, what they think their child can handle, um, you know, just what sleep training is all about. So, um, yeah, so... <laughs> 
sometimes what we do is we, you know, if you, you have to already, you have to be on board. If you're not on board, it just cannot happen, right? Both parents have to be on board, but not, no, but both parents do not have to carry out the sleep training, right? So sometimes only one parent will actually do the sleep training. Sometimes the other parent will literally leave the house, find another place to stay, to sleep, yeah. Sometimes they just like, they're in another room, they've got their headphones on, they're crying their eyes out, whatever it is, like I was during the sleep training that I did with my child, I think I cried more than he did. Um, so yeah, you're feeling with your mom's heart and that's natural to do. Um, when you know that your child um, is fine and needs the sleep, then you will start to get used to the idea that struggling towards the success of sleep will be okay, right? Um, there, there is a, a kind of sound that you'll hear when they are crying toward, you know, kind of struggling toward that success. You'll hear it in the cry. Sometimes there are nights where they're just, it just feels like escalation, of escalated cry at the top of their lungs for a long time, right? So that's okay too, right? This is a short period of time where you're offering an opportunity for them to learn the self-soothing skills. It's not gonna last forever. It's not gonna damage them forever. Um, it, it, yes, go ahead. Just a question on the self-soothing skills. Like yeah. the way I see some of those skills is it's almost like, um, it's like writing, writing a child's name, like, like, you know, Clara can't right now write in cursive a sentence. And if you ask her, you say, you know, you need to, to, to write in cursive this sentence in order to get this, like that, she doesn't have the capacity for that. Yeah, right? How do they have the capacity to start to do a C or something? Right. Yeah. And so it's finding it's, it's trying to understand what she has the capacity for. And when she's at the point where she's so upset and tired and whatever that we are making her do something she doesn't have the capacity for like where is that learning it's a great question sweet learning so, spot yeah so what we know is that developmentally as soon as babies are definitely six months and a lot of people will do sleep training at four months we see readiness at four months um, very often that babies can learn the skills of self-soothing so we know this just because they do it because when they're given the opportunity, they do do it. And because it's natural to sleep, the reason why they don't know how to do it is because we've been helping them in all kinds of ways that are appropriate as newborns, right? So it's only because we haven't given them the opportunity. And, but besides that, it's a natural thing. So that's why some kids will suck their thumb or some kids will kind of start rolling around a little bit or rocking themselves, um, kicking their legs, sucking on their tongue, rubbing their faces in the blankets, different things like that. But it doesn't have to look like that. Um, so it, yes, it's hard to say, what is it What is it that they're learning besides that you're not there to help them? Um, but it is that they cannot possibly learn it if we're always doing it for them. So the, the act of sleep is something that they will be able to do because they're tired. And so um, you can, you know, what some people will do kind of as a pre-sleep training idea is to offer less help. So I will sometimes um, recommend to people whose babies are still in cribs that rather than rocking them to sleep or feeding them to sleep, that you're going to lay them in the crib awake and then you're gonna have your hand on them on their belly and just do a very gentle rocking, for example. So some babies hate that because they want all the things that you, they used to do. Like, you know, some of my clients are sitting on a ball, they've got the baby, they're doing a bounce on the ball, holding the baby, they're nursing the baby, they've got a white noise coming out of their phone, they're doing all of the things, yeah? Because they learned, because the baby told them, and I know what it's like, my cat does the same. I have, my cat wants my arm to be in this position, I do it, he, somehow he taught me, I do it, that's what they do. They teach us what to do and we just do all the things, right? But, but you can decide, I, you know, if you, if you physically could not possibly do that for all kinds of reasons, they would get used to you putting your hand on their belly and saying, this is all I can do. 
and this is what I can offer as support, they will get used to it. So they will also then, so that's what I'm trying to say is that you can, you can wean them up the support more gradually, you know, do less. And um, some people find it a lot easier to rip off the Band-Aid all at once, but some people prefer a very, very gentle, <laughs> gentle, gradual approach, right? Where you are there for a lot more of it, more parental involvement. And it sounds like that might be something you could be more comfortable with. But just so you know, um, kids don't always cry less in those situations, right? Kids can sometimes cry all the way through the more gradual methods. And in which case they sometimes will cry more because it takes longer in the, in the long term. Um, so that's why it's really important to see how your child is doing in the situation. And, and if you have um, the kind of objectiveness to look at whether it's just you who wants to be there or whether you're really helping. Do you know, like, is it that you feel you need to be there or is it really helping your child? Um, so that can be tough to sort out. Yeah, that's a, that's a good answer. I think uh, my husband will like that answer too. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's... But sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes parents will disagree on what to do. And I had a client one time who wa really wanted to do cry it out because she was really, really done. She had an 18 month old and, and she was starting to climb out of the crib and all this stuff. And she was exhausted. She said, I need to do cry it out. I can't do anything else. I don't have the resources. And the father said, I'm not comfortable with that. And I'd rather do checks. And she said, if you want to do checks, you go ahead and do the checks and I'm out. And he said, great. And on the first night, he couldn't wake up at all. Um, and the mom <laughs> said, <laughs> cry it out, it is. And, you know, so sometimes that happens too. Um, you know, it's, 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 it kind of depends on the dynamics of the household. But look, if, if you're looking for support, please reach out to me about it, okay? And you know, the Happy Sleeper book, I really recommend if you're looking for um, just, you know, some words to, to read. I, I find myself, I like to read something over and over and over and just like think about it, let it sit. Because sometimes, you know, these words I'm saying, they, they fly out and you have, you have feelings about it. Um, but I think there's a lot of really great wisdom in that book. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. Who is next? Steph. Yeah, go for it. This is great. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and I, you made a good point where, uh, I know as parents now, you don't realize how important sleep is until you don't get as much sleep. So, um, I really, that really affects everyone. Um, but I have kind of like a two part question because clearly I'm hiding in our kids playroom right now because, <laughs> because my son Jonah is just over two and a half now and he struggles with going to bed because I think um yeah he naps in the day obviously at school and he just really struggles going to sleep and getting to sleep at our bedtime um yeah. I have a four-year-old that loves sleep goes to bed so easily um and he just struggles at nighttime and is like just wide awake, wide awake. And, you know, we do the three books, we do the bath, you know, brush your teeth, pajamas, book. We have a very strict bedtime schedule and it just, he really pushes and pushes. Mm -hmm. So my husband actually, Derek, he's not even going to make it. I think he just probably went to, Jonah just went to bed at 8.45. <laughs> um, and we do, we struggle with that yeah. um, as my first question, I guess. And then, um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I also have a second question of just in regards to him waking up. Like he's a, he, once he gets to sleep, he's, he's out, he's sleeping till almost like an internal clock for him. It's, it's about around 11 o'clock every night he wakes up and he wants yeah. to come in our room. I would yeah. say majority of the time, you know, Derek and I don't even hear him. He just gets like, he's like a ninja and he just squeezes <laughs> in between us. And I wake up like, maybe in the mid, you know, early morning, or in some days it just, we wake up at regular time and he's beside us. Wow. So I find it hilarious, but he's, he's so quiet about it. Um, wow. And the odd time he's not, and we try to bring him back to his room. Um, and it always takes us like, a, you know, an extensive period of time. Um, 
so I guess my question in that is like, if we see him in our bed, should we mm -hmm. bring him back to his bed, even if he's sleeping or she just let him sleep in our bed? You know, we're kind of, we're kind of unsure because he's sleeping. And then yeah. technically most days we're sleeping, you know, yeah. we're getting the rest. So it's kind of that <laughs> we're not sure what to do. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of a family decision around um, whether you want to, him to you know, have the skills to sleep through the night in his own bed. I do think that parents start to eventually um, think about, you know, how will that translate to other life experiences, um, sleeping in other places at friends' houses or other family members. Um, it's like, if he feels like he can't get through the night without crawling into your bed, then, it, you know, in my opinion, it might be nice that he has a kind of confidence around sleeping by himself. Um, so I'm in favor of, of giving him the opportunity to gain the skills to get through the night so that he does feel confident about it, that he has a kind of um, sense that he's okay by himself. I, I think that that can be important to, to be able to promote for him. Um, and I know when on the days that we'll we'll bring him back, um, oftentimes he does bring up the fact that he's scared, you know, or um, so we're, you know, there's some days where we're looking in his closet, you know, he he already has a nightlight. He has actually two nightlights. He has a flashlight that he he loves his flashlight and he keeps it beside his bed. Um, so there's a, there's a series of things okay. that yeah, that's important to bring up because I think, it, yeah, around this age, people start, kids start to talk about um, feeling afraid or that their room is scary or something like that. So that's something I didn't even touch on, but um, A, kids can learn these things, um, you know, from a Franklin, I think there's a Franklin, the turtle book that says, I'm afraid of the dark. And I was like, I never wanted my kids to see that book. They're not afraid of the dark. Why would you introduce that new new fear? Like it's terrible. So um, they can hear all kinds of things and learn it because babies are not afraid of the dark. But as kids get older, they start to hear about this possibility. Um, and so, yeah, I'm I'm not a proponent of um, of like the, these kind of tools like monster spray and stuff like that. I like to tell kids what's real and what's not real, um, and I like to you know put them at ease and say, you're safe. And sometimes you might feel a little bit afraid because sometimes I feel a little bit afraid and that's going to be okay. Right. And help them through it. Um, as kids get older, like around four and, and, you know, between four and 12, um, fears change and can, can get quite intense. And my approach is a little bit different, but regardless, um, if they are truly feeling kind of insecure being alone, then a little bit, um, of sleep training in a sense can be useful. And I like the check method in this case where, you know, you keep the, the, um, the intervals really, really short, like two minutes, I'll be back in two minutes just to check on you. Um, so that you, they, they are kind of learning to trust that you're always coming back. So there's building of trust and then there's building of confidence because they're staying and they're okay. You see, every time you come back, he's still okay, and they and they feel, you know, they build their confidence that way. So I like that kind of approach. It's it's very very involved. You have to you have to be on it. You have to be there every, you know, starting with let's say three minutes. It's a lot. It, it, the time flies, and so you're basically doing it all, all the time until they fall asleep. Um, in terms of the the schedule, um, okay, no, let me go back to the the nighttime stuff. Yeah, um, I would probably get myself into a position where he can't leave his room, um, putting up a gate or um, like using something like a door monkey to keep the door closed or keeping your door closed so that there isn't an option for him to come in. If you're interested in ending that practice of, of him coming in and sleeping in your bed, um, I would just make it really easy on him because um, that is it's really difficult for him to decide to stop his body from, from doing that thing that it's been doing over and over and over. It's a lot to expect him to make that decision for himself. And I like to use those actual physical barriers to remind him that it's time for him to sleep in his own bed, not as a punishment, but just as a really nice 
body reminder that this is what's expected of him um, and to keep him safe. So I, I'm in favor of that kind of thing if you're really interested in ending it because otherwise you're gonna be doing that return back and forth, back and forth and it starts a whole, I mean, I, I just wouldn't, emotionally, I would find it very, very difficult to deal with that. It, you know, you're, you're all losing sleep and um, tempers flare and it's not easy to avoid a power struggle in that situation and negotiations and all of that kind of thing. Yeah, and I always, I just have a quick comment there. Just, I find it interesting that at the beginning of bedtime, he falls asleep okay. And he, you know, he doesn't bring up that he's scared or anything, but in the middle of the night, that's when he brings up that he's scared. You know, I don't know if that's an excuse that he just wants to be in her bed or, but we, you know, we try to bring him back and. It's hard to know because he he might know that's really going to tear at your heartstrings. And, um, you know, kids learn that really easily. Uh, I have a friend whose four-year-old was saying that COVID was really making her sad. And um, she started to suspect that it was more about what she thought would make her parents respond, do you know? Um, and so, I mean, it's just a antidote, antidote, but it's regardless, I think that kids know what's what's going to work. Um, but it's also true that kids and we all feel a little more vulnerable at night. It's natural for us to, to feel that way. And that's okay too. It's, it's okay. And I think it's worth discussing. Um, but that also he's going to be okay and that he's safe and that it's healthy for him to sleep in his own bed. Um, in terms of the schedule and him having a hard time falling asleep, yeah, um, I do work with a lot of clients who are finding that sometimes nap will interfere with, with a bedtime that you like. Um, but like I said earlier, you want to always be watching how he's doing to determine, do you think he's tired, not yet tired, or overtired? And it can be tricky, and it can, you, sometimes you need a bit of experimenting to see what's working there. Um, Sometimes um, capping naps are useful, um, not always. And I think uh, with, we have a four-year-old as well. So on the weekend, on the weekends, often he he'll miss a nap just because we're out or doing something. Yeah. Um, and I find it is easier to put him to bed. He just yeah. I, I don't think he's quite ready to drop it completely though, because yeah. he does get that kind of five o'clock, you know. And yeah, grumpiness. Grumpy, yeah. Yeah. And, and during nap transitions like this, you, you'll have some some days with naps and some without, and that can last a long time. It's more of like a kind of weekly accumulation. So it's it's great to be flexible with that. Um, and so I wanted to just mention very briefly too that kids who are neurodivergent sometimes um, do have trouble falling asleep. Um, and this was something I, I didn't um, touch on. I, I meant should have put it in that slide. Um, but for example, kids who are on the spectrum um, tend, not all, but some produce less melatonin just naturally. So um, there can be some issues around falling asleep initially. Um, and so that is just another thing to look for uh, as, uh, you know, around sleep. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, who's next? Yeah, Adina's looping back in or uh, like, and I also want Ellie to talk about early mornings. Like, so you guys decide who's going next. Adina, you want to go? And then Ellie's going to I just up. have a quick question, I promise. Um, you know how when they're smaller, it usually takes, they say three to five days for them to sort of get that sleep training routine. Yeah. But when they're toddler, toddlers, what's like, what's the range? Yeah, it can take longer. But like I said, it depends on the method you're using. So if you're using a more gradual method, like the chair method, it just takes a lot longer. It's like kind of almost two weeks of the chair method, and then you're going to switch to the checks method. So that can be more like a month long endeavor. And it really, really depends on consistency, right? Because they are taking in that data. So it has to be consistent. And the minute you are inconsistent, they make note of that. And they say, hmm, I guess I have a little way, I see my way in there and it becomes much, much more difficult. So you have to have a really clear plan in order, right? If you want things to move uh, faster than one month, um, you can usually get, get a lot of um, progress within a couple of weeks. You know, even within one week, you can see a lot of progress if you're doing something like the checks method or the cried out extinction method um, because it's just a lot clearer. And so as long as everybody's on board and being consistent, um, yeah. 
Thank you. Welcome. All I right. Guess I'm up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Oh, Ellie, do you have a question about early? Um, no, our kids sleep fantastic <laughs> all the time since birth. Um, no, I don't like, I guess, um, I, Adita and I talk about all the time how Dea and Kip are like the same child, which is probably why they get along so well. Um, I will say like, um, so Kip kind of falls into that neurodivergent group and he's been on, we, it used to be like an hour, hour and a half for him to like fall asleep at night. And I know I said to Christy a couple of times last year, I'd be like, I know you don't believe me, but we are trying these things. And once we incorporated just a little bit of melatonin with pediatricians, okay. He's like, other than tonight, of course. Oh, the irony. He <laughs> is wonderful at night, like to get asleep. Um, it's just his early mornings. Um, it would be many, many months of like, oh, it's 345. It's time to be up for the day. Um, so I don't know. What do you want me to talk about, Kate? I, just want, I like, actually, it's my question also. It's like, like <laughs> because I, I, we've talked about early and it's not, yeah. it's not only you. It's like these early mornings, like they wake up at 5 a.m. And, and we don't want them awake at 5 a.m. And what do you do? to like get them to sleep longer yeah. essentially so that we can sleep longer. Yeah. So I will say like, um, I am a no expert, but I know Dave and I, and then Kate and Christy had a meeting not too long ago and just kind of game planned some ways to get him to like sleep a little bit more. And I know Elana has helped us quite a bit too. Um, shout out Elana, <laughs> but, um, we got them. It's not a grow clock, but it's the cloud. It's just, it's just a cloud that lights up. It's the same idea, except it doesn't stay on all night and you can program it. Mm -hmm. And it took Bellamy cause she hears Kip screaming. Like he's a, he wakes up and screams and screams and screams. Um, uh, it took, it took less than a week, I would say for her to like transition into like understanding what mm -hmm. that meant. And it's not always a hundred percent. Um, but we have worked it up to where like the cloud goes off at six 35 and it's to the point now where they will not always happily, but they are staying asleep until about six. Okay. Um, and then not always happily staying in their room, but it's to the point where they are like, so excited that they are like so proud of themselves when that stupid cloud goes off. <laughs> like it, it's adorable because it goes off at the exact same time. And they like Kip will be like screaming his head off, pissed at me, throwing his clothes, whatever, do your thing. But then like the cloud goes off and he just like, <gasps> and, like <laughs> I made it. <laughs> and like starts like he starts like singing the song because I'm like, oh, it'll say like, wake up, Kipper, wake and like I haven't. Okay, cool. You're singing it, so at least like we have found like if anybody else has like morning wakers, like that it took a while, yeah. and it's really annoying because it's just easier to get them up and like yeah. suck it up and be up at four thirty and just hate them for a couple hours and then you love them eventually, but. Like it's, it is one of those things where I feel like trust the process Yeah. from our experience. And I don't know, Dave, anything else to add? It's also hard too, because Dave like is, he gets time away from the family. He gets nights away. I mean, he's working, <laughs> but it um, can be like that extra challenge when it's just it's a holiday. Know right? Like yeah. me at home with the three kids and thank God the baby's the best sleeper, but, um, it can be a lot. So I, I find now, like, it's just easy to go in and say like, Oh, our cloud is still sleeping. It's still the middle of the night. Like I'm yeah. going to go back. I'm going to go yeah. back to my bed. You're safe. I love you. I'll see you when your cloud goes off. And then I leave. And yeah. I, I want to say also there's, you know, this expectation that you were touching on Kate of like being the martyr for your kids. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I think that it's such an unfair thing that has happened in our society where like, just isn't that your job to kind of be up and like taking care of your kid all night long? Um, maybe if we lived in a different kind of society where you had like a mini village of people who would then in the day take care of your kids or like help you cook and clean your house and like where you were all doing things together. Um, it's, it's not what we do. We have all kinds of responsibilities and we need to sleep. And so like you've done, you've created this space for your kids where you said, this is the space you're in until this time and it's sleep time. And I think it's brilliant. I love those clocks. I love that you stuck with it and you just decided they're going to learn it because I need them to learn it because we all need to sleep. And they did. Um, I think it's it's really, it, it takes a lot of energy to do that. It, it takes so much more energy, like you said, than just doing the thing where, you know, it's surprising when you look back on it, that you did all that, right? You were like, why didn't I do it sooner? It was torture, but it doesn't feel like it at the time, because it is really, really daunting to take those steps to say, we're going to implement some strategies, because it can get harder for a little while. And a lot of people feel like they just do not they do not have the resources for it to get harder for even one day. Um, so it can be really important to pull together what you can in terms of support, like call your friends and say, I need this, I'm gonna be doing this. Um, do what you can to um, you know, keep yourself accountable to this, this goal, which is really, really important for the family. So yeah, early mornings are the most stubborn problem. It's the most, and when someone calls me, uh, when a client calls me and says, everything's great, but except the early morning, what do I do about this early morning? I'm just, I, I panic because it is so difficult to figure that out. Sometimes it happens when kids are overtired, like I said. Um, sometimes it's just this kind of like waking habit and it takes a really, really long time to retrain the body to sleep at that time because um, it's much, much harder to sleep at five in the morning, when you wake up at five in the morning, it's so much harder to go back to sleep at that time. Our sleep drive is much, much lower. We're already doing a lot more REM sleep by that time, which is a light sleep. It's very easy to wake from REM sleep. So once we're awake, um, we've had kind of enough sleep. It's so much harder to go back to sleep. Sometimes, especially in the spring and summer, there's light coming into the room and then forget it, right? So it takes a lot more work to train your body to go back to sleep, but they have to have the opportunity. They have to know that there aren't going to be all kinds of options, right? Even, even the option of having your parent come in and lose her mind, right? Like that's something that they kind of like too, right? That's something, that's something. So um, that's, it can be really tough to make that decision to um, implement a strategy like that. And it can take a while, but it'll be worth it. And I'll just, sorry, I'll just add to like, we thought that we were putting him, like we were following his cues at night and like, we're reading him pretty good. And like, we didn't feel like he was going to bed super late, but it was like eight, eight thirty, And then after our ta, like our meeting, we like Dave and I were like, okay, like let's start bedtime at seven instead of like seven thirty, seven forty five. So we started a little bit early and now he's like, he will go down a little bit earlier. So it's just that like, maybe he was just a slight bit overtired by the time he got to sleep. Yeah. And I feel like now that he's going to bed a little bit earlier, like he has fewer nighttime wakings and it did take a couple of weeks yeah. To like build up. Like we did not yeah. start at six 30. Like I think I started at like five 15 and it was like, please God sleep until five 15. Exactly. You <laughs> so, have to give them a so chance. Happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. want to start with the kind of realistic expectations, yeah. yeah. but you're right. Like sometimes if you put them to bed earlier, they will just add sleep to the night. Right. And it'll be easier for them to fall asleep. And like you said, some kids can really benefit from the melatonin. Most kids don't benefit at all because most kids are producing the right amount of melatonin. Right. So for a lot of a lot of times, parents move to melatonin first because because the behavioral stuff is so much more difficult and they don't even recognize it. Right. Thanks for sharing. Pam, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Um, thank you so much for this. This is so great. Um, I have three kids. I have two and a half, five, seven. All of them are terrible sleepers, all of them. Um, and I definitely have not helped it because 
the two oldest are really close in age. So from the very beginning, I, it's almost like I will do whatever to get the other one to sleep faster so they don't wake up. Because as soon as I've got two awake at night, I'm outnumbered and like, there's no like, you got to wait, right? Like, and so yeah. with the three, I'm like all night long, I'm up because the two oldest have uh, nightmares, night terrors. Uh, the baby is just like partying all night long. <laughs> so I guess like my main question, because I don't think I can untangle all of it in like at all. But it's like, should I do, would I focus on one child at a time mm. or all at once? Mm. Because I feel like all at once, like I would be awake for a month that it was straight. But yeah. at the same time, it's like, if I'm just doing one, they're going to be upset. They're all equally as um, stubborn and like wild. And so there would be like children everywhere and screaming all night long. So it's just, I don't know. I don't know if it would just make sense. Do. Yeah, I think um, it is kind of dependent upon the kind of support you have. Um, I've I've never worked with a family that were implementing strategies for three kids at a time. Very often they'll do two at a time, um, but but so often the strategies are quite different for each child, just because of the age difference, and they're just in different places in terms of what the issues are for sleep. Um, so I could imagine perhaps that you could implement very similar strategies for the seven and five-year-old, and you might be able to do those two at the same time. Um, but lots and lots of prep, family meeting. First, you have to decide what it's going to be yourself, right? What is, what's the kind of new plan going to be? Family meeting, it's going to happen. It's not really an option, but like, let's get excited about sleep, right? Let's talk about sleep, how, you know, find the things that they're good at, bring those to their attention, um, lots of praise, lots of um, celebrating of mini successes, even when you start the strategies, because it's going to be, um, it's going to be tough. And there's going to be some times where you feel like the night didn't go that well. And like I said, that's okay. We get to try again tomorrow. Um, that was a tough night, that kind of thing, right? But look at all of the things that we did so well, right? So to help them to build confidence around it and some, you know, feeling that, you know, you're in this together and that there's progress, which is really nice. Um, so it's possible you might be able to work with two kids at once. Some people really do just want to do one at a time. And I can understand the issue where they said, well, why do I have to go to bed early? And when these guys are up here partying and I can still hear them screaming and stuff like that. So it does take a lot of coordination because you need to have some kind of cooperation among the entire family, um, some kind of respect for the process that you're doing. Um, there might be a way to help the first kid, like let's say you're just doing um, your oldest one first and just say, I'd really love, um, for us to have this opportunity to learn what's working well to help you to sleep. And then we can use the things that we've learned to help the other kids. Um, you know, that might be a, a strategy. Um, I'm not sure what will work for your, your own particular kids. Maybe that's not going to be very persuasive. Um, but I, I believe that you'll be able to figure something out. Um, and you can reach out to me if you have more questions and, you know, just around what methods or what, what you think you know what i think might be able to work specifically for you okay. thank you so uh, much I appreciate yeah it. i wish you the best of luck with it you can do it yeah i haven't slept for seven years so I no no you know sometime. what that time is over you're done with that your kids are old enough to sleep and they this is the thing they need to learn that they have to respect your sleep they have to respect your sleep i totally believe in that they're old enough to do that. And I used to say to my kids, like, if you, you know, before I, I didn't even know about those grow clocks and stuff like that, because my kids are 14 and 11. And so I taught them what, uh, you know, what the five looked like on the digital clock. I was like, not before that. Do not, you're not leaving your rooms. That's it. I needed it to be at least six o'clock. And that's how it had to be. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good luck. Thank you. All right, we we have time for one last question. Just okay, share, go. 
We don't hear you yet. If you can unmute yourself. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, sorry, sorry, sorry. Hi, Rebecca. Thank you so much Hi. for everything. It's been so great. Um, I just have one quick question. Reina, our daughter's Reina. Um, she's finally sleeping in the last like two months, like 10 to 12 hours. So we're like, great. great. A lot of training there. Um, my biggest question is like nightmares and night terrors. So I don't know if you covered that already, but. No, I don't. Um, okay. So she basically will wake up and like be really really upset and i come in and she it's like she's still dreaming or something um and she, it just kind of hard for her, her to even under like recognize that i'm there so i i don't really know what's happening i've done some research online but like is this common during this age and do you have any tips on how to like calm them down and then get them to sleep get them back to sleep yeah so night terrors and nightmares are completely different things, right? So a nightmare, um, nightmares are fairly uncommon, yeah? And that's another thing that kids will kind of latch onto. Um, mm. I had a nightmare and, and that is, it's easy for them to know that they're gonna get some attention around that. Um, it's really, really uncommon for kids to have nightmares every night. I just, I've never heard of it actually being true. Um, uh, night terrors, uh, it, it's a it's a parasomnia, and so it is something that usually kids will grow out of. Okay. Um, it's common to start seeing them appear around 18 months, um, but usually more like around age three. And um, the thing is that it is more common to have night terrors when kids are overtired. A lot of parents will find that if they get their kids to bed earlier, they will avoid most of the night terrors. So that's one thing that could, could be true for your child. Um, it's not always true. You cannot do anything to make them end sooner or make them go to sleep sooner. They, they are in a sleep state. They're not fully awake. Um, you want to make sure that they're protected in terms of not being able to hurt themselves. Some kids, um, you know, will flail around a little bit. Sometimes there's a lot of physical movement. Um, sometimes there's a lot of screaming and it can be kind of scary for parents, but it's not scary for them. They usually won't remember an experience and it's usually best to not try to wake them up from that experience. So just keeping them safe um, and helping them through that and and leading them back into sleep. So sometimes you, you, you know, I would expect you would need to be there for that. Um, you don't want to just kind of leave them. I'm not sure if, if she would be safe. Um, and you, if, you know, if you know that you're getting, uh, making sure that she's getting all of the sleep she really needs, like, so how old is she? She's almost two and 10 months. Yeah. So 10 hours is not going to be enough. Um, sleep probably. So, you know, it just, it depends on the child, but just making sure that it's so funny, like, you know, one hour can make a big difference. Even a half hour can make a huge difference to a little child, right? So um, making sure that she's getting the optimal amount of sleep for herself, early, nice early bedtimes might eliminate some of those night terrors. But if it's not, if they're not going away, um, with, with that kind of strategy, you could maybe talk to your doctor about seeing a specialist, but almost always they just disappear on their own. It's just a kind of like neurological experience that happens at a certain age. Okay, great. Yeah. Cause it wasn't, we, I don't know if I'm supposed to like touch her or, you know, um, yeah, it's it best not more than five to 10 minutes, but yeah, it's all, best all not to try to end it because there's kind of not much you can do about it, but just okay. keeping her safe. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. If great you can believe it, we have like reached the end of our time. Yeah, Katie, Kate, oh, sorry, Katie. <laughs> I had that in my mind and now it's locked in. I'm so it's okay. sorry. It's okay. Katie. I'll let you call me Katie. No one else. <laughs> you can call Just me back. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, I have just some, I'm so impressed with these questions. Everybody's so thoughtful and, uh, and they were bringing up all kinds of things that I should have already brought up. So thank you so much. I'm so glad we got a, a nice long Q and A. Yes, we are, we are pro Q and A around yeah. here, but I, I, I just want to thank first of all, you, Rebecca, and second of all, all of the parents for being vulnerable and asking all these important questions. Yeah. Uh, I think it's like Is there part two coming. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we keep going? Um, 
I think we all really appreciate your time, Rebecca, for, for giving, for giving your time and your expertise to us. And we will certainly, we can talk about this again. I can invite Rebecca back again, if you want to. Um, it, it's just huge. It, 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 sleep is huge for us, right. As toddler parents. So thank you. And thank you to everyone who came. Um, the recording is, is, will be up on our Google class.